everything you need to know to get started using the GATK. Um, all right, what is the GATK? GATK stands for Genome Analysis Toolkit. And yes, it is pronounced GATK, not GATK, or uh, various other things that I can't even pronounce. Um, this is the topic of some debate on the internet, apparently. Anyway, GATK, it's official. Um, the toolkit itself, which is aimed for general users, scientists who need to do research, you know, useful work. Um, there's a whole set of tools in the GATK that are mostly focused on variant discovery, uh, but there's also a variety of other things that will allow you to do some QC, things like that. Um, and we're starting to expand to include other functionalities. And part of the DSDE thing that I mentioned earlier, um, part of that is fusing with the Picard team and the cancer developers and so on, the idea is to stop duplicating effort by uh, developing tools on our own and instead bring that all together and put all of that as much as possible in one single toolkit that can do everything. One ring to rule them all, right? So the plan, what's happening right now is that we are, in terms of development, um, the Picard tools are being, um, the GATK is in part being rewritten in a format that will be more cloud friendly, that you'll be able to uh, run on cloud platforms, uh, which can be nice if you're not at the Broad. And even at the Broad, in fact, the future um, is in cloud computing, not computing on the Broad's own servers. Um, so part of the rewrite is being able to run GATK efficiently on the cloud. Uh, part of it is putting all this new functionality in. So all the Picard tools that hopefully you know and love or will grow to know and love uh, will be in the next major version of GATK. So GATK 4, it's official. You heard it today for the first. <laughs> Um, will contain all the Picard tools. It will contain some um, new, some cancer tools like Mutex. If you've uh, used Mutex before, Mutex 2, uh, the next generation souped up version of Mutex is going to be in GATK4 as well. So this has been a product of a large collaborative effort uh, and we're really grateful for the other teams who have worked with us um, to make this happen. And we're all one big team now, that's the point. Okay, um, so what affects you immediately is that basically the GATK is going to offer all the tools, if you add the aligners, um, that cover the process that you need to follow to go from raw sequence all the way to having a VCF, files, VCF file with variant calls that you can use in your research. Um, and so that's where, it, that's the, the overall process from even generating the samples all the way to the file that's ready for analysis. Um, our domain is right here in that pipeline that's going to go all the way from the mapping to the variant discovery and variant evaluation. Okay. Um, all right, so as part of what we do, we don't just make the tools, but we also try to provide detailed recommendations on how to use them, and obviously that's what you're here for today. Uh, we call that the GATK best practices. They're best practice workflows that we think are the best way to produce, uh, to run these analyses, and the world tends to agree with us in the sense that um, GATK is pretty much used um, in a majority um, proportion of variant discovery work. Uh, and this is not to brag, although that's nice too, but the point is really to um, convince you that this is the right way to do the analysis. Um, right, so we have our bread and butter really so far has been uh, variant discovery in DNA, uh, but we have expanded to RNA-seq. Um, and Ami, who will be uh, talking to you about this more today, has, um, along with other collaborators, developed best practices 
for, that are adapted specifically for the needs of RNA-seq experiments. Um, right. Um, the overall process, the variant discovery, is going to, uh, we split it up in three phases, three main phases. First, you have this pre-processing or cleanup of the raw data um, that you have to basically whip into shape so that it's uh, acceptable for GATK itself to, to run on, for the variant callers um, to make that variant calling analysis. So there's gonna be a whole bunch of steps here, actually more than what we show here, and Matt, uh, who is over here, will uh, give you a lot more detail about what happens uh, in this section. Um, the second panel, we have the variant discovery itself. We have a fairly sophisticated workflow that allows you to uh, very accurately distinguish noise from actual variation. Um, and several speakers will uh, speak about this. Um, Lewis and Sheila. Uh, then in the third panel, that's kind of the, the evaluation part. You've got your raw, your raw uh, variant calls that come out of uh, your variant caller. You still have to do quite a bit of work to refine um, the variant calls, the genotypes, and decide which part you want to keep, which part you want to filter out. And again, we have a lot of um, recommendations for this. Okay. Um, one thing we'll talk about in detail is that uh, GATK includes a specific workflow that allows you to do really large-scale um, cohort analysis. If you've uh, heard of Daniel MacArthur's work with the EXAC project, um, that's how they did it. Uh, so we worked with them to develop this workflow to enable that scale of project. Uh, right now we have the capability to analyze, to jointly analyze what, 100,000 uh, exomes. Our mission in the next few years is to scale that up to do the same thing with whole genomes and also scale up uh, to the next order of magnitude um, in exomes and probably whole genomes as well. So we're talking million samples. Um, but don't worry if you have a small cohort analysis that you want to do, this is also applicable and you'll see how this can help your small cohort get better calls. Uh, in terms of the RNA-seq um, pipeline, we're not going to go into as much detail, uh, but we are going to point out the few tweaks that we found were necessary um, to uh, do the analysis, the equivalent analysis. Um, so compared to DNA-seq, there's a few points that you'll um, encounter. One is that you're going to use a different aligner for the mapping. Uh, and there's an additional processing step that allows you to deal with splice junctions. Um, in RNA-seq uh, variants of discovery, um, you're, you're going to be using the same tools, but the workflow is simpler. Um, it's not because RNA-seq is easier, but it's because our work with it is more recent, and we have not yet validated the full large-scale analysis workflow on RNA-seq yet. In principle, it may work, should work, um, but since we haven't validated it, we can't make that our best practice recommended it, recommendation yet. So for now, um, the workflow there is actually a little simpler. Uh, and finally, one very important point is when you get to this variant recalibration step, um, this is the part where you're filtering your variants to decide which ones you keep uh, for your analysis and which ones you want to ignore. Um, for DNA, we have a very sophisticated algorithm that is going to allow you to do the filtering uh, using machine learning. Uh, for RNA-seq, you actually um, cannot yet use the VQSR, the recalibration process. So instead, you'll be doing uh, manual filtering, and we provide some uh, parameters that you can use to filter your RNA-seq variants. Um, one additional point, uh, I'm sure you realize that with RNA-seq, you have the problem that the allele ratios are going to diverge from the diploid expectation. Um, due to expression differences. And that's something we haven't yet uh, fully explored, but we're currently working on it, and we have 
some tools and functionalities along with collaborators um, that will uh, help you deal with this uh, in future. So all of this uh, uh, coalesces together into the best practices for variant discovery in RNA-seq. Um, all right, so that's, that was kind of the, the overview of the workflows that we're going to talk about today uh, in some detail. Uh, I just want to give you a few practical tips on how to use GATK, the tool itself, um, not just the methods. Uh, we'll be giving you a lot of this advice, but uh, just as a general uh, pointer, the syntax, it's a command line tool. There's no GUI. There's no user interface. There's no web interface. Uh, but you run it on the command line. Uh, it's a Java program. So you have to tell it where your genome analysis toolkit jar file sits. And then you have a number of parameters that give the tool name, parameters, and so on. And you'll see that they're very consistent uh, for the most part. Uh, it's, it's very similar to using something like Picard, um, where um, you have this fairly consistent syntax that you can reuse. So for some people who begin with command line tools can be a little nervous about it, but uh, we'll help you through that. It's um, really much easier than it may seem if you're not familiar with it. Okay. Um, I cannot recommend enough to look at the documentation online. There's really a lot of information, so please visit it. If you find that there are things that you cannot find easily, tell us that, and we will make it easier. We really rely on your feedback uh, to improve what we provide. Um, very, very quick word about the GATK engine. I just want to highlight the fact that the tools um, the analysis tools all rely on this one engine that's under the hood, and that provides a lot of very convenient functionality that is shared by all the tools. Um, and so I'm just going to mention a few that are very relevant and that people don't always realize exist until much later and think, oh, well, geez, if I have had known that, that would have been really convenient. One thing is that there's something called read-down sampling which means that when you have a very deep coverage at some sites, this is, this is a problem. Too much coverage, it sounds like you have loads of data, and that's great, right? But when you have too much coverage, um, the tools can get stuck because there's just too much to process. Uh, also, if you have very deep coverage, it's often indication that there's problematic mapping and so on. So you don't want to waste a lot of time in those regions. You don't want to have to deal with more data than what you need to have the statistical power to get good results. So most of the tools will actually do, do downsampling by default, where they by default only run on a subset of the data. If, but again, that's if there's very deep data. Usually, most sites don't get downsampled, um, but this allows the program to run kind of rationally through those deeper covered areas. Uh, and this can be also useful for some analyses uh, where you want to do that on purpose. So this is accessible. Um, read filters. There's a lot of read filters that are applied uh, by default. Again, the engine will filter out the data before it gives, it, gives the data to the tools. Um, and the purpose is to make sure that you don't get malformed reads or reads that have something in them that's going to make the uh, program crash. And so usually those are unusable anyway, so the engine filters them out. There's also additional optional filters that you can use to achieve specific effects uh, in your analysis. Um, intervals, very important to know about intervals in GATK, especially since most of the time you're going to be working with exomes. Uh, if you're working with exomes, you don't want to just run on the entire human genome reference or whatever organism reference you're working on. Um, you want to be able to, for many of the steps that we're going to cover, you want to be able to run on just the exome um, portion of the reference. And so you can provide your 
uh, exome sequencing targets to the program, it'll run much faster. And for some analyses, it actually makes a difference in terms of the quality of results. Um, finally, I should say that all of this, uh, I know it's a lot to take in, but all of this is abundantly documented in the engine parameters. So if you're ever looking for parameters that you read about online, somebody told you about, but you can't find them in the documentation of that specific tool, like for example, half type caller, uh, think about looking in the engine documentation because a lot of uh, convenience functionality is in there. Any questions at this point? No? Okay. Um, I should mention that there are several ways to parallelize GATK to run faster. Uh, for the most part, uh, we like to use something called scatter gather, where you chop up the data in little pieces and you process them individually. You can do that in parallel, finish your analysis much faster. Multi-threading is also an option, but it's to some extent less stable. Um, Apologies to the engineers for bad-mouthing the uh, <laughs> functionality, but that's the case. Um, and if you're, if you're at Broad, um, scatter-gather functionality, I think, is available in Firehose, possibly. Um, but anyway, basically, you need to set up a pipeline where jobs are chopped up and uh, reunited. Uh, it's worth putting in a, lot, a little bit of effort to um, get that done. All right. Again, getting help, the support forum, we, are, we try to be very responsive. Um, you'll either see uh, Sheila or myself uh, on the support forum at all times. Uh, David, actually, I should say, is joining us uh, on the team as well. So uh, we uh, try to answer as many of your questions as fast as possible. So it's really the best place um, to, to ask for help. Just please don't email us because we won't answer. And it's not because we don't want to help you, but it's because it's very difficult to track who we have helped and what information we need to give out in emails. Uh, so emails and phone calls are out, but the support forum is your most reliable avenue for getting help. Uh, with that, that's the basics of how GATK works and what's in it. And now we're ready to actually uh, talk about the variant discovery pipeline. Any questions?